I guarantee that by the end of this video, even the biggest Disney fans will have learned something new. Hey everybody, it's Molly with Mammoth Club and I'm at my favorite park in Walt Disney World, Disney's Animal Kingdom, back at it with another Secrets video. The last time I was here, I took you through some of the most popular attractions in Animal Kingdom and told you some of the backstories, the details, the imagineering that makes these attractions so wonderful. And today, we are back at it with part two, now with a little holiday twist. We're gonna be exploring more of the park and sharing some of the details, stories, what makes this park so magical. I am telling you, the attention to detail is unbelievable. Plus, the holidays have kicked off here at Walt Disney World, so we're gonna check out some of the holiday decor, the puppets, maybe some treats. I'm super excited, let's get to it. We have made it into Animal Kingdom and the storytelling has already begun. One thing Disney does incredibly well that you don't even notice, which is on purpose, is immerse you into the different experiences. There's a reason that you don't walk into Animal Kingdom and see the Tree of Life right away. There is a reason that you walk through this incredibly lush, beautiful tropical experience slightly uphill to slow yourself down so you take in all of the greenery and the leaves. There's a reason for that. They are trying to immerse you into the story of the animal kingdom. Have you ever noticed how completely barren the parking lot is here compared to the other parks? That's on purpose as well. Unlike the other Disney parking lots that often have those strips of grass um, or maybe some water like over at Epcot, they didn't have any of that. They made sure that the parking lots here at Animal Kingdom were completely barren. They are just a concrete mass. Then to transition you into the story of Izzy's Animal Kingdom, which is all about being one with nature and the circle of life, they bring you through this beautiful oasis that has waterfalls and you can hear the water rushing, you can hear birds, you can see all these incredible trees. Even the animals they chose for the oasis are animals that have calm and gentle dispositions to ease you into the story that you're gonna be a part of. Interesting side note, Joe Rody's original idea to enter Animal Kingdom was to go through a giant Noah's Ark. And then they were like, Should we lead with religion? No. So they scrapped that and did this. But by walking in slowly and carefully through the beautiful oasis, it transforms you, it transcends you, it takes your senses and it gets you ready to end up right here. By the time you can finally see the mascot of the park, the tree of life, the thing that you know you're supposed to see when you walk into this park, you get a picture perfect view. Because one, you've been walking uphill, like I said, which again slows you down and makes you appreciate your surroundings, but it also ends you up 20 feet higher than you started at the parking lot, which means that you get a perfect view of the tree of life. Everybody else is lower than you, so you don't have people in the way. You get this beautiful view of the tree of life where it looks perfect and crystal, but not not too imposing. And now you can begin your slow descent to the base of the Tree of Life to look at it from different angles. And the hope is that you look and enjoy the Tree of Life from all different angles throughout the park, as it truly is the symbol of everything that Animal Kingdom stands for. And don't worry, we're gonna get a much closer look at the Tree of Life. I got lots of Tree of Life fun facts for you, show you my favorite places to see the Tree of Life. But for now, my favorite holiday thing is about to happen. So we have to have some joy real quick right here in the uh, entrance of Discovery Island. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, here they come. Okay, at Disney's Animal Kingdom, during the holidays, they have these amazing puppets. They're called the Merry Menagerie. And I'm telling you, they are the most wonderful, joyous thing you will ever see. I can't wait. Ah! <laughs> Hi! Hi, Mama Bear! How are you? You are so cute! Ah! <laughs> You're so cute! <laughs> Here comes baby! Ah! Oh my gosh, they're so cute! Hi baby bear! You're so cute! Hi! I love you so much! Thank you! It was so nice to see you again! You're my favorite part of Christmas! <laughs> the puppets are 
are just joy. They're joy personified. They are amazing. These puppeteers are so incredible. They truly bring these animals to life. You will swear you are petting a real bear or a real fox. They are just amazing. So the Merry Menagerie runs pretty continuously as long as it's daytime out in Animal Kingdom. They usually start like early to mid morning and then go through early evening. There are two groups that will rotate with different animals. Um, I saw the group that had the polar bears and the fox and some of the birds. There are also reindeer and penguins and a seal. And it's just like joy. You, I saw kids interacting with them. I saw grandparents interacting with them. I just like, I have the biggest dumb smile on my face. I love this park at Christmas. I think these are just wonderful. The animals are so popular and loved that they are even the decorations here in Discovery Island. They've got these beautiful lumieries that will light up at night and just be such a beautiful and sweet holiday presence. And if that isn't enough, if you take a look right here over the Riverside Depot entrance, you'll see these snowflake ornaments that are part of the garland here. Those are extra special because they were made by uh, folks from the Augusta Training Shop, which is a nonprofit that works with adults with mental and physical disabilities to provide them jobs. And I just think it's so amazing that Disney used these snowflakes and uh, it just, it gives y'all the warm and fuzzies here. Don't sleep on Animal Kingdom at the holidays. They may not have the flash of Magic Kingdom or the festival of Epcot, but they are wonderful. I could literally stand and watch those puppets for hours, but we've got other things to talk about and show off. I promised some Tree of Life facts, so that's where we're headed next. If you know me, it's probably no surprise that I grabbed a coffee from Creature Comforts, which is the Starbucks here in Animal Kingdom, and I'm headed back to my favorite place in all of Walt Disney World, my secret coffee spot behind the Tree of Life. This is one of my favorite places to just sit, relax, enjoy a coffee, and the beauty of this park. And it's gonna be a great place to talk about the Tree of Life. Is it not just gorgeous back here. It's absolutely stunning. Plus you're right here on the river so the character flotillas come by and I can hear one coming right now and it's oh my gosh Scrooge and Launchpad ready for Christmas. Pocahontas and Miko just drove by as well. I'm telling you this is just one of the most relaxing and beautiful places in a park. Plus we're having our coffee with a purpose today. Did you know that you can donate to the Disney Conservation Fund at creature comforts. Gonna leave you in suspense on that one because Mickey and Pluto are coming in their holiday outfits. The Disney Conservation Fund helps protect real animals out in the wildlife, works with different organizations to help with their habitat loss, uh, to create sustainable practices. Uh, they do things like develop the program with the bees and the elephants they talk about over on Kilimanjaro Safaris. And since it was founded in 1995, they've donated over $120 million to wildlife causes. And when you make a purchase in Animal Kingdom, whether it be at a gift shop or yes, at Starbucks, you can donate to Conservation Fund. They'll give you this cool button and and Disney matches anything that you donate from a dollar up to a million dollars if you happen to have that. I donate a couple dollars every time I get a coffee or buy something. I try to remember to do that. Um, and just helps me uh, feel warm and fuzzy inside knowing that I'm giving back to the beautiful animals that uh, roam the planet with us. Oh my gosh, and speaking of goodwill, Santa Claus is on a boat. Does it get better than that? Santa liked my ears. I'm having a coffee. It's a beautiful day behind the tree of life. We've helped some animals touch the puppet, it's a great day. All right, back to the tree of life. The Tree of Life is the mascot here at Disney's Animal Kingdom. It serves to be the Spaceship Earth or the Cinderella Castle of this park. The icon, the thing that you know you're going to see when you arrive at this park that draws you in and brings you into the story. And of course, being the Animal Kingdom, they couldn't just do any mascot. Anything industrial wouldn't make sense for a park all about the circle of life and the beauty of nature. So Joe Rohde, the lead Imagineer on Disney's Animal Kingdom, one of my personal heroes, he and the team had the idea to create this giant beautiful tree of life with all of these different animal carvings inside of it. There are actually 337 different animals carved into the tree of life and it expands all throughout it from the roots down by the, it's tough to be a bug theater all the way into these caverns and caves up to the tallest branches. There are again over 300 different animals carved into it. Some very big and some very small. But no matter what the size was, the artists only had between five and eight hours to carve them before the plaster would dry. And I know I've said that before, but it absolutely amazes me every time I look at the Tree of Life, especially when you think about how big some of these carvings are. Look at this cat right here. Look at the detail on that. Look at this anteater over here. Look at this monkey. Look at that owl. And think about the fact that they only had 
eight hours at most to carve all of that detail. It is absolutely incredible. Now, while I did say this is not an industrial building, I kind of lied to you because while it doesn't look like an industrial building, it actually is. It's made out of an oil rig that they were able to then cover in plaster and create all these different animals around it. The Tree of Life stands at its tallest point, 145 feet tall, and it's 160 feet wide. It also has over 100,000 synthetic leaves on it to bring it to life before your very eyes. I think my favorite thing about the Tree of Life is that no matter how many times you see it, no matter from how many different angles, you always discover new things the longer you look at it. Like, I don't know if I knew that there was a moose up there at the very top. I've never really noticed. He's right above the, the rabbit right there. That's very cute. I encourage you on your Animal Kingdom day to spend some time weaving in the roots of the Tree of Life and looking at it from all different angles because you're going to find all kinds of creatures throughout the way like here's a snake right here. Love that. Also love this beautiful horse right here. Look at the detail on that horse. And there's plenty of ways to weave through the different routes back here on this trail that I always take across from Creature Comforts. You could go through the queue at It's Tough to Be a Bug. That'll get you some great views. You can also go through the Tree of Life Gardens. But really take some time to enjoy the Tree of Life because it's absolutely stunning. And like, look, look at this. We got a little frilled lizard right here. A little frilled lizard like Frank from Rescuers Down Under. We are now headed to find some of my favorite animals in the Tree of Life. Not because they're my favorite animals, though there are sharks carved into the Tree of Life, but because of how clever these particular animals and their location are. When you go through the It's Tough to Be a Bug queue, at one point you go deep into the roots of the tree right here and you're gonna find animals that don't exist anymore, like dinosaurs. And that's because we're in the oldest parts of the tree and so we're looking at the oldest animals in the tree. See the T-Rex head right here. You have another dinosaur right here. You've got this like dolphin-like dinosaur that I forget its name. Someone in the comments will tell me all these dinosaurs, I'm sure. You have a giant squid right here. And if you look up, you have a pterodactyl. I bet very few people notice this pterodactyl. I almost forgot about him as well. I think that's a triceratops. So cool, right? Is that just wild? Like, I, I truly, could come to this park and do nothing but stare at the tree for hours and I'd be perfectly content and I'd probably find 20 new animals I've never noticed. Grabbed a little snack and came over to eat it in the Flame Tree Barbecue dining section. Not only is this an amazing view of the character flotillas, look, Russell and Doug are coming here right now. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen them in forever. Hi, Russell, hi, Doug. But you also get this amazing view of Expedition Everest. This is a great place to come eat and enjoy. But also there's another detail in all of the seating here at Flame Tree Barbecue that a lot of people don't notice because people don't look up often. Flame Tree Barbecue has a ton of these outdoor dining locations and they've got different colorful uh, roofs over each of them. But each of them actually has an animal relationship motif displaying the circle of life. And because this is the seating for Flame Tree Barbecue, these are all predator prey relationships. So right now, I'm in the section where you will see crocodiles eating fish. I'm sorry, I've been distracted. Hi, Timon! Hi, Rafiki! <laughs> oh, there's just so many great places in this park to just relax and enjoy yourself. But as I was saying, I'm sitting in the section that has crocodiles and fish. There's a place with anteaters and ants, snakes going for mice, but also eagles going for snakes and others. And it's a beautiful and colorful, whimsical way to talk about the circle of life. And speaking of eating meat, this is the pulled pork mac and cheese from Eight Spoon Cafe. Eight Spoon Cafe is one of those little quick service locations around Discovery Island. They specialize in mac and cheese. They've got this one. They also just have classic mac and cheese if you'd like that. They also have a pulled pork sandwich on a donut obviously not eating that but this is one of my favorite snacks in the park got some delicious pulled pork on there lots of bbq sauce little pickle absolutely not sir i see you watching me mm. all that cheese look at that cheese mm. drummers are going by it's a great time to be alive this is one of my favorite snacks 
It's certainly a snack portion, um, and it's got this really creamy, delicious, very cheesy mac and cheese. And you've got the nice moist pork on there, as well as the little bit sweet, little bit tangy barbecue sauce. And I like the crunch and zip from the pickles as well. If I was gonna have one critique, it's that I wish I had more pickles so that every bite could have that zesty crunch, but a very delicious snack. This park is some of the best snacks anywhere, and this is a great one. Plus, again, the view and the characters, can't beat it. Next stop on our little tour around Animal Kingdom, Africa. Africa here at Animal Kingdom sets you in the village of Harambe, a port in East Africa, which was designed after many, many trips to real Africa by Joe Rohde and the team of Imagineers. In fact, they traveled so much to research when developing this park that they traveled enough miles to go around the world 20 times. So while the village of Harambe is fictional, it's very much rooted in reality in the way that it's designed, in the way the architecture looks, in the way the decor looks, especially you can see it right now at the holiday time, in the way it looks very weathered and old, made to look that way. Of course, this park only opened in 1998. It's not near as old as they'd lead you to believe. One thing the Imagineers noted when they were in Africa is that the resourcefulness of the people was first and foremost. They don't put anything to waste, which you especially see now during Christmas season when they have the holiday decorations up. Look around at the decorations. They're going to be unlike any other park and unlike any other section of this park. You're going to notice that they reused a lot of materials. Take a look at this wreath right here. It's made out of bottle caps. Later on, we will see Christmas wreaths made out of tires. We're also looking, if you look up here, the garland is made out of scraps of fabric and doesn't it look absolutely beautiful and festive just the same. So that's that's one thing you are going to notice when you walk through this land is that they are resourceful. They have made everything from natural elements or things that would otherwise get thrown away, but they are wonderful. We're going to go check out some animals in a moment, but I want to direct your attention to a very important detail right here, kind of in between the Tusker House and Festival of the Lion King. This distinctly puts you in Africa because this bench right here says Uhuru. That is in Swahili, that means freedom. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But again, it means freedom and then it says 1961. That's because there was a very important election in 1961 that turned the tide during a very rocky historical period. So this very important bench, little detail that I, I read in an Imagineering book recently. I thought that was awesome that they included that. I know I mentioned the signs in the last uh, Secrets video I did. I just love them so much. And uh, the specific one I'm gonna point out this time is this one with Captain Bob's Super Safaris. If you know who Joe Rohde is, you may realize he looks a little familiar. I'm also gonna highlight this hot air balloon trips sign and note that it is Kinga hot air balloon trips. But before I tell you what Kinga means, I need to talk to you about something very important, something that truly brings Animal Kingdom to life and separates it from any other theme park. Did you know that there are dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of different species of plants here at Disney's Animal Kingdom? In fact, there are over 3,000 different species of trees, shrubs, and plants from every continent around the world except for Antarctica, and over 4 million individual plants, trees, and shrubs, which is absolutely incredible and amazing. And I know I've mentioned that before, but this park truly comes to life because the landscape changes around you as you explore the park. Disney does that very well in all of their parks, but it's especially clear here in Disney's Animal Kingdom. Now, the person that we have to thank for this incredible landscaping, the head of landscaping when developing Disney's Animal Kingdom was a gentleman named John Shields. What does all of this have to do with Kinga hot air balloon trips? Well, what if I tell you that Kinga in Swahili means immunity? And what's another word for immunity? A shield. I mean, is that attention to detail or is that attention to detail? No one would even notice that. Who would know that? But now you do. You can impress your friends. Scooting now to go look at some animals up on the Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail. There are two major trails here at Disney's Animal Kingdom, and these are somewhat of a secret of themselves. A lot of people overlook them, breeze right past them, but they're really a great place to relax, unwind, maybe let some of your kids have energy, jog ahead a little bit, and uh, leisurely look at the animals, which is what this park's all about. Over in Asia, you have the Maharaja Jungle Trek, and here in Africa at the exit of Kilimanjaro Safaris, you have the Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail. 
Now, a thing to keep in mind with both of the trails is that they typically close earlier than the park because of the animals, so make sure to look in the app so you don't miss out on seeing them. When this opened, it was called the Pagani Exploration Trail, but they decided to change it to Gorilla Falls because not enough people realize that the headliner animal, gorillas, were here and available to be seen when you're at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Look at those monkeys up there. At Animal Kingdom, they have over 300 different species of mammals, reptiles, birds, fish, uh, and over 2,000 individual animals between Animal Kingdom Lodge and the park here. One thing to notice as you're walking along the trail is who's walked the trail before you. Here you see some hoofed animal footprints, which might be a hint as to who you're about to see. It's the Okapi. I know they're related to the giraffe, but I always like the fact that they basically look like they're wearing zebra pants. So cute. And uh, they just had a baby Okapi recently. I don't think he's out yet, but I hope to see him at some point. His name is Benny. And speaking of babies, that is one of the things Disney's Animal Kingdom does amazingly well, is they help uh, with different species that are struggling in the wild. They help preserve them. And the first baby animal born here at Disney's Animal Kingdom was a baby greater kudu, which is a type of antelope. One animal that Disney has helped tremendously with is the Guam Kingfisher bird. The Guam Kingfisher bird is actually extinct in the wild, and there's only about 140 of them left in the world. And of that 140, Disney has hatched about 40 of them in their conservation program. So they're doing a lot of good work to help preserve uh, and, and fix things that humans have done. Now, as someone who doesn't love birds, this part of the trail does stress me out just a little bit because it's the bird watching section. You can scan a QR code and pull up a bird watching guide on your phone and then trek about in here and see what you can find. <gasps> a yellow bird. Look at this cute bird. It's like a fancy duck. Let me see what you are. According to my bird guide, you are marbled teal. Aren't you a pretty? Yeah, you're pretty. And this yellow one right here in my guide is a Taveta Golden Weaver. I will admit, these birds are very pretty. And now I'm thinking about the Disney Channel original movie, The Color of Friendship, where the story of the weaver bird and how they build their nests is integral to the plot. And a shameless plug for our podcast, Zetus Lapidus, where we watch all the Disney Channel original movies and then recap them in excruciating detail. We just uh, released the Color of Friendship episode, so check that out if you're interested. Yeah. Of course, the star on the show on this trail are the gorillas. There's two different gorilla habitats. Here you've got the mamas and the babies and the uh, younger gentlemen, and then across the way you've got the older gentlemen, the bachelor pad. But they are so fascinating, and if you're lucky, you'll get to see some of the babies while you're here. I'm always curious about crates and addresses when I see them in Disney parks, because it usually means something. And this one is addressed to the uh, New York Zoological Society, and it's on Southern Boulevard in the Bronx. So I googled the New York Zoological Society, and guess what? It's on Southern Boulevard in the Bronx. Nothing is an accident. They are so amazing. And we're getting a great view of them right now because the trail closes pretty soon. So they are ready to go in for night, night time. So they know where they go in. Uh, and the uh, cast member just told us that they actually are lined up to go in because they go in one at a time and they know which order to go in so that they go into their each of their individual rooms inside. As with Kilimanjaro safaris, it's best to do the animal trails at the beginning or the end of the day because you're likely to get more active animals when it's a little bit cooler out. But any time that you can take a spin on those is lovely. Headed up to another part of the park that you could almost describe as a secret because a lot of people don't realize that there is a land off of Africa that you can only access by train. This is Rafiki's Planet Watch. This is a kind of kid-friendly but interactive experiences abound uh, up in Rafiki's Planet Watch. And we are going to take the Wildlife Express, which is the train that'll get you up there. And it's the only way to get you up there. Now, speaking of the train, very important, keeps in theming with our design of Africa because you'll notice once again that there is a stark contrast between the kind of industrialized portions of the Africa Harambe section and uh, the more natural sections of the African section. So you'll see things that are rusted, the paintings kind of chipping, and the train itself doesn't look quite new. That's because it's modeled after a train from the 1920s and 1930s. Oh my gosh, hi sweetie. 
Guys? And the cheetahs back there. Additionally, this is not a real steam engine like the ones at Magic Kingdom. However, you can still see that they have a water tower as if they'd need to refill the steam engine here. It says Harambe on it. It's very natural. It looks very, very different than the uh, industrial, modern looking one over at Magic Kingdom. Because again, in Africa, you would use what you had available to you and be very resourceful with your materials. The Wildlife Express is the only way to get to and from Rafiki's Plano Watch, and the ride up itself is pretty enjoyable considering you have uh, different animal exhibits behind the scenes that you can look at, and sometimes you'll even spot some of the safari animals backstage, such as rhinos and ostriches. <gasps> the baby rhino! The oh my gosh, hi, sweetie! Aww. Oh my gosh, so many rhinos! Hi guys! And the cheetahs back there! Rafiki's Planet Watch is a great thing to do with your kids when you come to this park because kids love trains. That I know for sure. Kids love animals. And there's a special animal activity up here. We have arrived up at Rafiki's Planet Watch. First thing I'm going to point out to you are these benches. These used to be around Discovery Island, uh, however now they all exist up here at Rafiki's Planet Watch and they are all made from recyclable materials, specifically recyclable milk jugs that have been colored uh, but very obviously fitting with the theme of animal kingdom and conservation. And speaking of colors, the entire theme of Rafiki's Planet Watch is hopeful optimism. It's supposed to be very approachable. It's supposed to be very kid friendly. So you're going to see colors and designs used throughout. Even the animals you're going to see the way they've designed them throughout this exhibit are very welcoming. The Imagineers want you to walk away, especially children to walk away with hope for the future and excitement about conservation. Made it to Conservation Station, but before we head in there, take a look down. This is something a lot of people literally walk all over and don't pay attention to it. But in the ground here, you actually have the circle of life uh, being illustrated here. You've got all different kinds of animals. You've got fish, humans, birds, spiders, frogs, lizards, snails, lions, and as Mufasa says, all together in the great circle of life. There are several things to do up here at Conservation Station. There is a drawing class, the animation experience. Some of you may remember it used to exist over at Disney's Hollywood Studios uh, in the building that is now Star Wars Launch Bay. But here they have the animation class where you can learn to draw various Disney animals. They just added the Zootopia characters, actually. The cast member let me know they were doing Judy Hops today for this class. This is on Genie Plus. It does fill up because of the small capacity. So if you want to book it on Genie Plus because you've already purchased it, it's not a terrible idea. But usually if you show up about 15, 20 minutes before the class, you can grab a spot. Also inside here, there are some small animal exhibits such as amphibians and reptiles. You may even see some of the Disney Animal Sciences cast members working on animals doing different procedures. But the most exciting part of this is the affection section where you can actually pet animals. Okay, you can't pet like lions, that would be awesome, but obviously dangerous. However, you can pet goats and sheep and pigs, and this is the Imagineer's response to the fact that being around animals all day, they know everyone wants to pet them. So again, while they can't let you pet some of the more exotic, dangerous animals, they can let you pet goats, and it, it, this is literally built to like indulge you because uh, you're so excited about being around the animals all day, and you're excited about animals that like even though you can't pet an elephant, at least you got to pet a goat, and you are still going to walk away with that love for nature. Goats. I came here to drink coffee and pet goats, and I'm all out of coffee. Bueller, you're so cute! <laughs> Alright, and I didn't come up here just because I wanted to pet goats and talk about the history of Rafiki's Planet Watch. I also wanted to point out these cutie patootie piggies. Their names are Dottie and Charlotte, and if you think they look a little familiar, perhaps you've seen Moana, because these were the pigs that the animators based Pua, the sweet little pig from Moana, on. It's actually something the animators do a lot, is they use the Animal Kingdom animals as references for Disney films. If you've seen The Lion King, the quote, live action version and been on Kilimanjaro safaris, you may see some parallels there as well because they use the real lions, hyenas, and other characters from Kilimanjaro safaris to be references for that version of the Lion King. I just love coming to the affection section. The Imagineers were right that people want to pet animals when they see animals all day and the goats are so cute! Cute! 
came inside for a quick lap around the conservation station. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that Rafiki's Plano Watch does close early. The train will stop before the rest of the park closes, and the animal exhibits obviously close early. So keep that in mind as well. But one thing I do love looking at is the food section. Uh, they have samples of different food that they would feed to the different animals. So you've got like herbivore pellets right there. They've got flamingo pellets. They've got alfalfa cubes, primate biscuits all different styles of food here. And if you can imagine, when I said there are over 2,000 individual animals, there is a lot of food that needs to be served. In fact, over 10,000 pounds daily is prepared and fed to the animals here at the park as well as the lodge. 10,000 pounds. That is a lot. Wow. And I think I eat a lot. Snake warning in three, two, one. Hello, sir. How are you today, sir? He's just chilling right here. I enjoy the snakes. It's my Slytherin instincts. I think he's sleeping. Let's go see if we can find other snakes. Or, you know, just other animals. Oh, a spider. Spider warning. Stop Look at all the animals with their little Christmas hats on. That's so cute. The last thing I want to highlight here at Rafiki's Planet Watch is right inside here where the restrooms are. There's this incredible mural with tons and tons of different animals. I could absolutely stare at this mural all day to take in all of the different sweet creatures and all the animals' faces. And they even kind of made the animals have gentle, sweet facial expressions because, again, this is supposed to be about childlike wonder and hope and optimism. But beyond Beyond that, this mural is home to a lot of hidden Mickeys for my hidden Mickey fans. In fact, at one point, I'm not sure if it still is, but at one point it had the most hidden Mickeys in one single area of anywhere in Walt Disney World. It may have been dethroned by uh, Mickey Minnie's Runaway Railway, that attraction, but there's a ton to look for if you start looking around in this mural. I'll point out a few and then if you're up here, this is a great activity. But here's one in the spider, three circle hidden Mickey pretty standout one here in the ostrich's eye. This one's pretty small and harder to see, but if you look in the lizard's, I don't want to call it an ear, but like the back of his head, uh, the lizard above the deer there, there's a hidden Mickey. Not a hidden Mickey at all. I'm just happy that the hyena's getting represented here. Double the Mickeys and the butterfly wings here. Another harder one to see, but on that polka dot fish right there, there's one peeking out from behind the octopus. Another butterfly hidden Mickey pair. There's one on this fish too. There's said to be a hundred of them on here. So that's enough to get you started. But if you start looking around in here, you're definitely gonna see some hidden Mickeys. But for now, we are headed back into the park because we have a few more lands to explore. Back in the main park and ready to continue exploring. But I have to draw your eye first to this cute, not so hidden, hidden Mickey. And by that, I mean Fichwa in Swahili means hidden. So it's a literal hidden Mickey. It's a little play on that, which I love. I also adore this detail, this quote right here. It does not matter who you are or where you are from. We are all children of the world. And that is just beautiful and what this park's all about. We've made our way into Asia where they have some of the most beautiful holiday decorations that you're gonna see anywhere. Here outside of the Feathered Friends in Flight Theater, you are gonna see these beautiful lanterns that are supposed to celebrate Diwali. Diwali originated as a Hindu celebration, but it has expanded to other religions as well, including Sikhism and Jainism uh, and Buddhism, and it is India's most important holiday. Upon trying to educate myself a little bit more about Diwali, I was trying to learn a little bit more about other cultures. Diwali is known as a festival of light that celebrates the triumph of light over darkness, good over evil, and the human ability to overcome. And uh, that is, I mean, I can't think of anything more worth celebrating than that. And I just love that here at Animal Kingdom especially, they include celebrations from this time of year from other countries and other cultures. Because while Christmas may be the most widely celebrated holiday in the United States this time, Time of year. It is certainly not the only holiday celebrated this time of year, and it is certainly not the most important holiday worldwide this time of year. So I just love that Animal Kingdom takes a moment to appreciate these other cultures uh, and hope that other people learn about things that are a little different that maybe they didn't know about 
Moving further into Asia, one of the things I love about Africa is also the thing I love about the Asian section here. It's that everything looks weathered and old, and maybe I'm the only person that thinks this is interesting, but these buildings look like they've been here for a very long time. They are rusted. They are weathered. They, the paint is missing. That is all done on purpose. Look at the cracks in this building. You think Disney would have cracks in a building if it wasn't for theming? No, they would not. And I just find it so fascinating, and it's something most people don't even pay attention to, but yet you know need that authenticity to really put you in these spaces to feel like you've traveled to places around the world. The other main trail here in Disney's Animal Kingdom is the Maharaja Jungle Trek, which is located in Asia back behind Cali River Rapids. It features a variety of monkeys, bats, Komodo dragons, but most importantly, the headliner is tigers. And there's a very cool tiger store I'd like to share as we go see if we can find the majestic beasts. You see, there were a few executives and higher ups in the Walt Disney Company that were concerned about the appeal of animals and if animals could actually hold a guest audience the way a thrill ride could or the way a classic attraction could. And Joe Rody thought this was nonsense. So during a board meeting led by Michael Eisner, Joe Rody walked in with a special guest. That special guest was a live tiger. Everyone stopped listening to Michael Eisner, the CEO at the time, and focused on the tiger who simply existed there. As the tiger left, the board members, the managers, the executives were mesmerized. And the question of if live animals could actually entertain guests was never asked again. Just walking by, I noticed this detail I've never seen before. They have this water jug up here with a pipe running through, and I thought, I bet that runs to a water fountain. It runs to a water fountain. They even go so far as to have a sign that says, Trekkers, please use this water provided here for your convenience. Do not drink from streams and wells. And obviously, this is not actually where the water is coming from, but the fact that they added this detail in that basically no one's going to notice was they're going to the restroom or getting water just speaks to the storytelling here. I went into the entire backstory of Expedition Everest Legend of the Forbidden Mountain TM in the last video I did. If you haven't checked that out yet, make sure you do. But here's those posters again that give you the Legend of Forbidden Mountain, that section of the uh, attraction name. You've also got some fun jokes in here like Yeti. It's a tea brand and you can actually see that tea brand in the queue for Expedition Everest. This one, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, probably not knowing Imagineers, but this one uh, talks about Mustang coffee which is a, a signature beverage of this Sherpa here. They actually serve a Mustang coffee over at the Nomad Lounge. I am also really enjoying the Sassy Yeti Fashion Boutique. That is a hilarious name. And last but not least, you will see a poster here for the Yeti is Real. There's going to be a seminar hosted by the professor of the Circazong Village, which if you go into Expedition Everest in the queue, you will see that he has curated the museum. It's just unlike any other park being here. Like, there is so much detail in Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and Hollywood Studios, Disneyland Parks. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying that the incredible level of detail to bring these real-life places, it's, it's amazing. I, I notice new things every time I come here. Dusk has fallen at Disney's Animal Kingdom, but we still have two more lands to explore. I feel like a lot of people come to this park in the mornings and not at night. And I understand why. It's open the earliest and it closes the earliest. So a lot of people will come here first and then park hop elsewhere. But this park is exceptionally beautiful in the evening time especially right now with all the holiday decorations. We have made it to Dino Land USA, one of the most controversial lands in all of Walt Disney World because a lot of people don't get it and don't know there's actually an incredibly detailed and rich backstory that goes with the land. So without further ado, the tale of Dino Land USA. Dino Land USA is located here in Diggs County along Route 498. I mentioned in the last Secrets video that 498 stands for April 1998, which is when this park was opened specifically on Earth Day. But prior to this having to do anything with dinosaurs, all there really was was a gas station. It was run by brother-sister duo Chester and Hester. Brother, sister, husband, and wife. You decide. Unbeknownst to Chester and Hester, Diggs County is a gold mine for finding fossils and dinosaur bones, which it's called Diggs County, so kind of manifest destiny there, am I right? Once all these incredible paleontology discoveries were made here, different scientists decided this had to be a headquarter for dinosaur research. So they built the Dino Institute. 
The Dino Institute is where Dinosaur, the attraction, is located. When you go on that attraction, you are visiting the Dino Institute. Now, who else goes to a Dino Institute? Who else goes to a research facility? Well, that would be your grad students, your undergrad students, people taking college classes. Those students are poor as college students often is, they don't have a lot of cash money. They needed a way to make a little bit more cash, so they decided to open up a little hamburger shop so that they could make some extra money while attending classes at the Dino Institute. What's that hamburger shop called? The Restaurantosaurus. Because they figured if you slap Osaurus on the end of anything, it's silly and fun and it works with Dino Land USA. Now you can actually tell that the grad students not only work at Restaurantosaurus, but live there as well because if you look up on the rooftop, you will see all kinds of shenanigans from a basketball hoop, lawn chairs on the roof, darts, beer cans, just general college and grad student shenanigans are happening over in Restaurantosaurus. But what about Chester and Hester? Do they still have their gas station? Kind of. They turned their gas station into a roadside shop and pitched up Dino-rama because all kinds of people were coming and stopping to go visit the Dino Institute and they thought we want a little piece of that dinosaur pie, which is why you have Chester and Hester's gift shop. It's very kitschy, it's very roadside attraction, and it's meant to feel that way. You also have Chester and Hester's Dino-rama, which is where Triceratops Bin and Primeval World May It Rest in Pieces are located. That's not because they're kitschy carnival attractions because Disney Disney didn't have any other idea. It's because they are kitschy carnival attractions because that is the idea. Somebody was trying to profit off of the Dino Institute by building kitschy dinosaur themed attractions. Now, last thing I'm going to point out, if you're wondering where they're digging up all these dinosaur bones, it can't be inside the Dino Institute. Well, look no further than the Boneyard. That is the kids themed playground and you will actually see them in the middle of digging up various dinosaur bones. Hopefully knowing all that detail makes some of the Dino Land haters feel a little bit differently about this area. I know a lot of people think there's not a lot going on here and that the theming is silly and cheap looking, but it's really incredibly detailed with such a rich backstory. I personally love it and I think it is uh, one of the most underrated stories in all of Disney kind of lore. A couple of tangible details to look for here outside the gift shop is proof that it did in fact used to be a gas station and it was not any old gas station it was powered by dino gasoline we've got dino power and it's kind of funny because fossil fuels dinosaurs there's a connection i learned about it on universe of energy May that also rest in pieces. And here is something that is so astonishing because Disney Imagineers do not leave anything unturned. Take a look at this unassuming building that you've literally probably never looked at in your entire life, no matter how many times you've been to Walt Disney World. It is simply a maintenance shed, not only for Disney cast members, but in our story of Dino Land, it's also a maintenance shed for Chester and Hester. And the Imagineers thought in 1998 that in the story of Dinoland USA, this maintenance shed would have been around for 40 years already. So it would be weathered by the wind. The paint would be chipping. It would be rusting a little bit and no one would care to fix it because it's simply a maintenance shed at a gas station. No one's going to put the tender loving care that you'd put into, I don't know, a theme park. So if you look at this shed that nobody pays attention to, you are going to notice rotting and weathering along the bottom. You are going to notice paint missing. You are going to notice rust. Again, nobody pays attention to this, but this is all part of how detailed these parks are. Going to point out two hidden Mickeys now, if I could. The first is right here on this dinosaur statue done by an artist called Mr. Imagination. And this is actually one of the smallest hidden Mickeys anywhere in Disney World. It's very hard to see, but it is definitely a hidden Mickey. As you can see, this dinosaur is made out of all kinds of recyclable treasures pieces of metal, bottles, glass, and one thing that he used was a one-year anniversary pin from a cast member. When you are a cast member at Walt Disney World, they have different pins that you add to your name tag for different things like anniversaries, celebrations, etc. And one year is a Mickey pin. The other main hidden Mickey in this area is on the ground right here, right outside where you can meet some of the characters and a drink stand made in the concrete right there. But that's not actually my favorite thing in the concrete over here. You've also got this shape right here, which probably looks like nothing to you right now, but let me explain what it's supposed to be. You may realize that I'm standing across the street from Triceratops Spin, which is essentially Dumbo with dinosaurs. It's a spinner style attraction, no higher requirement, great simple attraction to put in park 
parks, especially for those kiddos. But a lot of people make jokes about how Dumbo is the original. And uh, it looks like the Imagineers are making a joke as well, because if you look closely at this, it looks like Dumbo flying away from you. You've got ears, little head, body, and his two feet. Imagine a Dumbo elephant flying away from you. It's almost as if Dumbo is telling Triceratops Ben to kiss it. Is that not genius? I just love that kind of stuff. Okay, one more thing I want to talk about in Dinoland, and that is the cute holiday decorations. For example, take a look at this giant snowman, and if you look closely, he doesn't have a carrot for a nose, he has a duck bill. Because here in Dino Land, year-round we are celebrating Donald's Dino Bash. And that's a party being thrown by Donald Duck with all of his friends because he learned that dinosaurs and birds are closely related and he thought that was worth celebrating. The decorations are so cute in Dino Land because the idea was that all of the different characters decorated themselves. So typically over here, Launchpad McQuack would be here and he decorated the beautiful water tower here as a uh, landing pad for him. You can also see on top of Restaurantosaurus, they've got some uh, Santa Christmas lights back at Chip and Dale's meet and greet. It looks like they decorated it themselves. You'll even see the paint brushes they used to draw uh, and paint on their sign. You even got Christmas lights all over the main dinosaur bones that greet you as you come into Dino Land. So it really does have that kind of kitschy, tacky, cheesy holiday feel. Totally different, totally different feel from the beautiful lights we saw in Asia and the beautiful lanterns we saw in um, Discovery Island, but it totally fits for Dino Land. And moving into our final land of exploration today, we are going towards Pandora, the world of Avatar. And I saved it for last because this land is exceptionally beautiful at night. Now, one thing I want to point out that you literally can't see at all because it's pitch black right now. There is a dragon shaped mouth right here. You'll see a dragon kind of stone-like structure. That's because initially this was going to be a land called Beastly Kingdom. It's also why a dragon is one of the icons over the ticket booths and in the Animal Kingdom logo, if you look at the original logo. Initially, again, this was going to be a land called Beastly Kingdom, but due to budget cuts, they were down between Dino Land USA and Beastly Kingdom. Dino Land USA was further along, and they had to scrap one, so they ended up scrapping Beastly Kingdom. Additionally, Dino Land USA was supposed to have a thrill ride called the Excavator in addition to uh, Dinosaur, which was called Countdown to Extinction when it opened, and that got scrapped along the way as well. Now, of course, this area is Pandora, the world of Avatar, but when the park opened, it was Camp Mini Mickey, which is where Festival of the Lion King originally debuted, along with a show about Pocahontas and some character meet and greets. Just like they needed a variety of plants to create the rest of Animal Kingdom and bring it to life, they needed a variety of plant life and different fauna here in Pandora as well. So part of it is made up plants, different things from the universe of Pandora called puffball trees and vein pods, but those are mixed with over 250 species of real plants that create this otherworldly look. The Imagineers, the landscaping team, looked for plants that would suit and fit and match along with these fake plants. In fact, they used over 500 trees and 10,000 shrubs to bring this area to life. A great example of that is the Dapofet, which is a water plant. It's sitting next to agave, which is a very real plant because they have a similar look. They both have the spiky long leaves and they fit together, again creating this kind of alien planet that we're on right now. But the most famous plant here in Pandora is this, this giant pod, the Flaxa reclinta, which not only greets you as you walk into Pandora, but you can actually interact with it, which not many people realize. If you come right here to this glowing section of the pod, 
and stroke it. It will actually start misting and foaming and steaming. And if it wasn't obvious, the reason that I recommend a nighttime visit to Pandora as well as a daytime one is because of the bioluminescent forest. All of the plants around you, including the sidewalk, light up with this incredible glow-in-the-dark glow. And it really is even more breathtaking, which I didn't think was possible at nighttime. Uh, than it is in the daytime. Of course, the most famous and iconic part of Pandora are the floating mountains. And if you want to know how they were made, sorry, I'm not going to spill that secret. They're too majestic, but if you really want to know, you can watch the Imagineering story on Disney+. Plus. That's where I learned um, against my will, because I wanted uh, not to know, but now I do. Doesn't make them any less magical, though. The mountains were created by over 60 artists from around the world. And in total, there are 22 different mountains reaching a peak height of 130 feet tall. And if you look closely at the different mountains, they are incredibly detailed. At first glance, they simply just look like a variety of vines and moss and rock work. But if you look closer, you will actually see habitats for different animals, like the exotic sting bat. You may see banshee nests. You're going to see different shrubbery and greens and plants growing on there. They are truly works of art. Again, 60 artists from around the world, United States, Peru, Ireland, Italy, France, and Japan, and Portugal created these gorgeous mountains that are just jaw-dropping, regardless of if you're an Avatar fan or not. My favorite detail to look for in the mountains are the fake waterfalls because some of them are very real. Cycling through real water that drips down, you can take your picture with it and they're amazing. But some of them, if you look further back, are just rotating clay wheels that are designed to look like waterfalls but aren't actually, which helps with maintenance and the upkeep of this beautiful area. I might have said that before, but it's such a cool fun fact. I hope you don't mind hearing it twice. Headed now to ride one of Pandora's attractions. No, now Flight of Passage, the most popular one, even though that is the headliner attraction here and many people's favorite ride in all of Walt Disney World. I rode that one during the last one of these, and if you want some fun facts specific to that attraction, you can check out that video. We are actually headed to Navi River Journey. This is that slow-moving boat ride that anybody in the family can enjoy here in Pandora. The first thing I want to point out is this woven version of the Shaman of Songs sitting right outside the attraction. There's a banshee over by Flight of Passage as well, and I just think these are a beautiful introduction to both of these rides. I also like to highlight these Navi feet over near the Lightning Lane queue, because that'll just give you a little indication of how the tall the Navi are. They're usually about 10 feet tall, and uh, they've got quite a footprint. It's about two of my feet. Now, Navi River Journey is a trip through the bioluminescent forest where you're going to come face to face with some of the wildlife of Pandora. This is kind of Pandora's take on the wildlife trail. And it's some people's not favorite attraction. Some people feel it's a bit overrated. And sure, I can see that if you waited in an hour long line for a slow moving boat ride with only one uh, animatronic, albeit the most impressive animatronic Disney's ever created. However, if you're buying Genie Plus and you get a lightning lane for this or you ride it later in the day, like right now it only is a 25 minute wait, I think it's a really nice attraction. I think it's a classic Disney style attraction being a boat ride. And it's nice that the whole family can enjoy this one. And truly the Shaman of Song is amazing. The Shaman of Song is the most detailed animatronic Disney has ever created, which is why I concluded it in this video today. Just like the Navi people, she stands 10 feet tall. I remember when this promo came out for Pandora, I thought it was a person. I thought it was a real person in makeup. I did not think it was a robot. I really do think Navi River Journey is a lovely attraction that you should do at least once if you're a Disney fan just to see that animatronic, if nothing else. Now I'm taking this kind of secret little path between uh, where we were at Navi River Journey over by Satuli Canteen and Pangu Pangu. Sometimes this is used for the queue for Flight of Passage, but if not, it's a really cool way to get around and get yourself on the backside of the beautiful floating mountains. Because we got one more thing to talk about here in Pandora, and that's Christmas decorations. Holiday decorations. You didn't think we were gonna talk about holidays in Pandora, did ya? But you bet your blue Navi behinds we are. Just like the rest of the park, the Christmas and holiday decorations have an incredible backstory. So we got to start with the backstory of the land in general. 
Pandora the World of Avatar takes place after the first movie. After the bad guys, the RDA have already moved out, but they left some facilities here. And now Ace, Alpha Centauri Expeditions, they are the humans that are working with the uh, Navi to work on tourism. Why? I don't know. I don't think they need capitalism to run their society, but they've allowed it just the same. So here at Satuli Canteen, where it's very industrial, this is where RDA's headquarters used to be. There's details in there about that. You also have some of that over here at Pangu Pangu, the snack stand. This is where the humans of planet Earth that work for Ace live over in these sections. So it makes sense that this is the only part of Pandora that's decorated for the holidays. And it's really fun because if you take a look at the details and things like the garland, you're gonna see that some of it was handmade from materials and resources and natural items they found around Pandora. But then they also brought some stuff from home. You've got things like Christmas lights all over the machinery here. In fact, they even went so far as to turn them into Santa Claus with the hat and the beard. You've got garland here glass and crystal reindeer. You've got nutcrackers, including one that looks like a Navi. That's possibly my favorite thing, a menorah. And then again, if you take a look at this beautiful garland all woven in here, it's very natural with things like pieces of plants, thread, yarn, and then little wooden sculptures of different Pandora creatures. You've got the Pandora horses, the Pandora dragons, the Pandora deer, all right there. And one last little nod to Joe Rody that I'm going to point out. If you look here, you've got dog tags. This is Pangu Pangu, the snack stand, where you can get that amazing pretzel, the Pongo Lumpia, green beer, the night blossom. But you've got, again, all these dog tags right here. These actually are pictures of the Imagineers that brought Pandora to life. And the chief Imagineer way up there at the top, you've got Mr. Joe Rody himself. Headed back to Discovery Island now for one last little holiday moment of joy. That is, first of all, the luminaries are going to be all lit up and beautiful. And second of all, the Tree of Life Awakenings, which is the short projection show on the Tree of Life, they've got holiday versions. There's one little story about a fox who tries to make presents for all his friends and it doesn't work out, but then in the end they all come to him and I cry. And there's also one about baby winter animals seeing snow for the first time. Now these aren't long shows, they're just a couple minutes long and they rotate every couple minutes or so, but they're really sweet. The projections are amazing on the tree. It's incredible how they bring it to life. And it's a nice end to your day at Animal Kingdom. wonderful day exploring this absolutely gorgeous park and sharing some of the best kept secrets, details, Easter eggs with you. I hope you had fun and I hope that you learned something. Let me know down in the comments like I promised you would at the beginning. Of course, the highlight for me was playing with the Merry Menagerie puppets. They're just so cute. Don't skip Animal Kingdom for the holidays. I promise you won't regret it. We've got more holiday content coming your way. We've got a whole series of these secrets videos you can go check out right now. In the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, follow us on social media. And until next time, friends, I'm Molly, and it's been so magical and very merry. Bye!